Chinese President Xi Jinping had declared a firm line on Taiwan in his opening speech yesterday at the Communist Party Congress. He said China can and must reunify with the island by force if necessary. CNA's Lok Wisu looks at whether constructs that have kept the peace across the strait for decades are still fit for purpose. The first visit to Taiwan by a U.S. House speaker since 1997. Nancy Pelosi's arrival August 2nd on the self-governed but China-claimed island sparked military drills on a scale not seen before and mutual outrage, each side accusing the other of willfully upending the status quo. Let me be clear. The Speaker's visit is totally consistent with our long-standing One China policy. Our purpose in going to Taiwan was to say that we have this strong relationship built on the status quo, which we support. The Taiwan Relations Act of 1979, at the same time as our change of recognition, establish the terms of our relationship, the three U.S.-China joint communiques, and the uh, six assurances. So there is no departure from that. From the first communique of 1972 to the six assurances of 1982, you would think these would serve to frame the terms of, and thus ensure agreement on, what an American official second in line to the presidency can or cannot do in Taiwan. But, as I found out, putting this question to a panel of experts, apparently not. From China's perspective, actually these kind of official visits by the US politicians definitely violated uh, the One China policy and also the three communiques between the two countries. From the US perspective, uh, they think that actually China is escalating the hostile actions against the Taiwan. So that's why they need to do something, including uh, increasing the military aid to Taiwan to deter the potential uh, Chinese aggression uh, upon Taiwan. For, from the China's perspective, they think that actually the U.S. is uh, changing the status quo, which China needs to do something, uh, including some military actions, diplomatic actions, uh, to deter the U.S. from interfering too much. The U.S. commitments on not recognizing Taiwan, on having unofficial, you can, I mean, it doesn't say you can't have contact. You can have high-level unofficial contact. It's not that China previously didn't see a uh, sitting speaker visit Taiwan. We see lots of congressional delegations. Before the Pelosi visit, there were 10. China made various kinds of noises. So even where the line in the sand uh, China's trying to draw, it's not particularly clear as well. So that adds, of course, to a lot of this contentiousness and confusion. Much of this contention and confusion is decades in the making. The troubles of today can, in all likelihood, be traced to the makeshift maneuverings of the past. In the late 1960s, early 70s, the U.S. was engaged in a land war in Asia, in Indochina, uh, and was trying to, to extricate itself. It was trying to prevent a conflict with the Soviet Union, and the greater objective was to build a relationship with China to counter the Soviet Union. And, and that came at Taiwan's expense. Part of that process of changing recognition from Taiwan to China is the U.S. government tried to put in place structures and mechanisms so that the U.S. could continue to have an unofficial relationship with Taiwan, and that included the Taiwan Relations Act um, and, and unofficial uh, channels of communication. If you talk about the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, Beijing has never really accepted that. I think even from its uh, inception in 79, Beijing has contested it and has uh, saw that as a little bit of a betrayal of the normalization communique in 78. But I think all of this also rests on the fact that if you look at the basis for the current U.S.-China relationship, um, going back to the 72 communique, right, essentially it was an agreement to disagree. Part of the fundamental problem is the, the very first communique, the Shanghai communique in 72, really lays out, when you read it, Shanghai, China's position Correct. and the U.S. position without a consensus between them. They, they simply go side by side. This Correct. is what China wants. This is what the U.S. wants without any agreement. And then you have the 92 communique, or the 92 consensus, and it too also states that there are different interpretations of essentially the same thing, which means you don't have any consensus underlying the fundamental agreements that China 
China keeps pointing to as somehow a binding course of action that everyone must follow. All right, so essentially from the 1972 Shanghai communique in which there's this line, there is but one China and Taiwan is part of China. That one line has created all the problems that we see today and all the communiques and assurances are not going to be fixing this. That's because we're only reading part of that line, right? The beginning part of the line is that the United States acknowledges that all Chinese people on both sides of the strait. So that has two conditional clauses. One is it's the US acknowledges, doesn't endorse, doesn't support, but acknowledges the Chinese position and all Chinese people on both sides of the strait. So the question is what if you know, people on one side don't see themselves as Chinese in the political sense of having to be part of the same entity, they can still be culturally Chinese. So that statement itself, if we look at look at it, you know, fuller in its sort of fuller context, is itself, uh, you know, ridden with ambiguities and conditionalities. But everything in life, whether in diplomacy or in private life, is riddled with ambiguity. Why is it we're able to live with it without having to call it strategic ambiguity or make? a specific call for strategic clarity. Why are we able to live with ambiguity on so many fronts, but on this one it has created so many unlivable problems? Actually, ambiguity actually sometimes is a beauty for diplomacy and politics. So sometimes you don't need to be so clear-cut about everything. So I think that's also uh, one of the basis for the communiques between the China and the US and also for some of their consensus over the Taiwan issues over the years. For example, uh, this Taiwan independence is another ambiguous uh, concept. Uh, from Tsai Ing-wen's perspective, actually there's no need for Taiwan to declare independence anymore because Taiwan is already independent. From China's perspective, actually, China does not need to use force currently because Taiwan is not independent yet. But now it seems that everyone wants the other side to be very, very clear on certain things. So that has also caused a lot of problems and escalation of hostility these days. At the crux of uh, this idea of strategic ambiguity um, is this concept of dual deterrence, right? You, the US wants to prevent any side from unilaterally changing the status quo. And being overly clear uh, could encourage brinksmanship uh, by either side. But it was meant to deter Taiwan unilaterally uh, declaring independence. Or and be of, taking the yeah. But uh, I suppose the concern now is less that Taiwan will do that under Tsai Ing-wen, who has been a very cautious, pragmatic leader. And the greater concern is we need to deter China from carrying out any kind of invasion on Taiwan. So it is, it is a, a tool for dual deterrence, uh, and it's a flexible tool, and I think that's what most leaders of any major power want, is decision space. So it's both to deter Taiwan uh, from declaring independence, and I think under, under President Tsai Ing-wen, as you mentioned, she's very pragmatic, she's very cautious. Uh, she's also very considerate of U.S. interests because she sees that as, as an overlapping interest with Taiwan's. So that's a low risk, but uh, in the event of a future leader that's maybe more, more populist, uh, that could be a problem that the U.S. needs to manage. So if one were to give Taiwan unambiguous uh, ironclad guarantees uh, uh, for their security, then that could lead to behaviors in Taipei that, that don't benefit the United States. So ambiguity still has a function here. Absolutely. As long as all sides have vested interests in agreeing to disagree. The man many credit and a few censure for engineering the basis of US-China relations once described ambiguity as sometimes the lifeblood of diplomacy. For the world has changed since then, National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger hammered out with China's draw and lie that breakthrough statement we now call the Shanghai Communique. With neither side now showing much interest in pursuing even the semblance of an agreement, there's little prospect of an amicable resolution. Something that at least on this panel, there is unambiguous agreement. You know, China wants essentially to take over Taiwan, um, and Taiwan doesn't want that. And so, how are you going to get around it? It's asking Taiwan not to be itself, it's asking Taiwan to accept, in, in their eyes, a less good outcome than they currently have. And I just don't see how that can be attractive. So long as China sticks to its one country, two systems construct, the insistence on the 1992 consensus, which by the way was never a consensus <laughs> in the first place, um, you, you, you really don't have many positive dynamics at work here leading towards peaceful resolution. You have mostly coercion and potentially the use of force, which China refuses to renounce as well. 
the Taiwan issue is not only a, a geopolitical issue or a territorial issue uh, about the power politics in East Asia, it's also an ideological issue because the U.S. also sees uh, Taiwan as a new model uh, uh, versus China. U.S. regards it as a very successful democracy model in East Asia. For China, they think that actually the mainland Chinese model is the best model for China. So that's why I think this issue has also become an ideological problem. And also I think it will become very difficult for them to solve it uh, at the moment, given the current geopolitical and ideological situation in East Asia.